All right, let's get started. Lecture 23, our second lecture related to vertical curves. Today's lab, or today and tomorrow's lab, is going to be interesting in that we do a horizontal curve stakeout. So I know that's a little staggered that we're doing a horizontal curve lab this week, but we're talking about vertical uh, uh, curves uh, today. But um, it is our last field lab. We have one more lab over or after uh, Thanksgiving break, but it's in, in inside. So it's our last field lab. So today you, or tomorrow, depending upon what lab you're in, you get your vests. Awesome. All right. Um, one thing I'll mention on the survey, I am again asking on AutoCAD, has, has everybody tried to give it a shot for installing? Hopefully. Um, I have already set up five virtual machines for students that requested last time. If you asked last time, or if you answered that last time, you don't need to do it again. But if you think you're going to need a virtual machine, go ahead and put it on the um, uh, put it on the the, the survey, and um, we'll get it set up. Uh, the, and just to be clear, all right, everybody, just to be clear, what these virtual machines are is I'm reserving one of the computers in 2241. Okay. So, and it's got to be one computer per student, right? So, if you think you're going to need one, go ahead and put your name down. And the computers have like like ID numbers, like like it's like computer number one, computer number two, computer number three. So, um, uh, uh, if you think you're going to need one, I'm going to reserve one per student. Okay. If you are installing AutoCAD, please make sure and review the instructions that I posted on Blackboard on how to do that. Um, there are a couple things that will make your life a little easier uh, in that regard. Sound good? Any questions? Let's get to vertical curves. Okay, I am going to use some Excel today, by the way, so if you want to follow along with me, feel, please feel free. Um, it's not absolutely necessary, but it's kind of nice. Okay, um, I want to make sure that we all remember that we are dealing with an um, equation of a parabola. When we look at vertical curves, we're not dealing with circles. Remember, with vertical curves, we have defined a structure such that, or defined a curve such that we have a constant rate of change of slope, right? So the second derivative of this function is constant. And so if you integrate a constant twice, you get a parabola. And so that's why we use a parabola for vertical curves. And I also gave you the NCWES handout um, uh, that has vertical curve uh, expressions on it. We're going to dig into that stuff a little bit more today. Um, today what I want to talk about is about designing vertical curves. And I'm going to show you two different um, aspects of how you would design a vertical curve uh, or two different goals, as it were. Okay. One of those goals is to match elevations. I would argue that the math for this one is a little bit trickier, but we're going to do uh, a little bit of uh, tricks with Excel. Do you all remember in Engineering 111 when we used this little trick called Goal Seek? Y'all remember that? So we're going to be we're going to be using Goal Seek today uh, to basically solve this equation. Um, but the idea behind a vertical curve is, or behind. Um, uh, 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 behind uh, this design is we're trying to develop a vertical curve such that it meets a fixed point. So for example, if I have a curve that, let's say here's, you know, my, my uh, sag curve, right? So here's the VPI, okay? And I've got a grade this way and a grade this way, okay? The idea is that I want to size this curve such that when it's all said and done, it passes through a particular point, okay? And there are very many reasons why we would want that to happen. So for one, if we have a road going this way and we want to match it to a road going this way, so we want the grades to match. Um, the other reason why we might want to do this is if we have clearance issues. So we want to, um, we want to size the curve such that we leave enough uh, uh, clearance between the road uh, and things such as you know maybe an overpass or maybe the distance between the grade line and any underground utilities or drainage and what have you. So sizing a curve to go through a, com a, a fixed point is a very important uh, 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 skill to be able to solve. So whenever you're doing this type of problem, you typically know where the VPI is, and you because you know where the you know what the approach grades are. So the idea is that to design the curve. What we're doing is we're taking this equation and we're plugging in our known values and we're solving for L, okay? Um, the math can get a little, I don't want to say hard, but it, you know, 
gets a little bit messy algebraically, so a trick is to use goal C. Um, so what I want to do is I want to go through this example. Um, this example um, is uh, I've given you a, a sag curve. I've given you the grade in and the grade out, so a negative 4% grade going in and a positive 3.8% grade going out. The station of the VPI right here is 52, and I've given you the elevation of the VPI. And I want to size the curve such that it meets this target uh, elevation right here. Okay. Now, I want to be clear. I'm going to pull up the, the class notebook real quick. I actually gave you the hand calculation solution in there if you want it. But I'm, I'm more interested in doing this inside, um, uh, uh, inside Excel. Okay. So to be clear, what we need to do is we basically need to work around this equation right here. Now, some of these values we already know. We know G1 is four, negative 4%. 4 we know G2 is negative 3.8%. We're solving for L. So when we set this up in, um, in Excel, we're going to just input a dummy value and then let Excel goal C uh, in, order to, um, uh, uh, in order to generate our, our answer. Okay? But what we really need to focus on is really two things. We need to focus on the, this term right here, but more specifically, we need to know what this term is, what X is. Okay? So I want to make sure that we're clear on some basic terminology. So if I have a curve like this, right? So this is the VPI, this is the VPC, and this is the VPT. And the curve goes you know, something about like that, okay? Now, I want to think about this equation, and I want to think about what the value of x is, okay? I propose that right here, the curve is x equals 0, okay? That's where x equals 0. So symbolically, what is the value of the curve right here? This is x equals L, right? Right. So this is x equals 0, x equals, da, 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 x equals L. When I graph this parabola, this is the value of x equals 0, and this is the value of x equals L. Does that make sense? Is everybody with me on that? So the question then, okay, so let me ask you this. What is the value of x right here? This is 0 and this is L. What's that? Half of L, exactly right. This is L over 2. Okay? So then the question is, if this is x equals 0, this is x equals L over 2, this is x equals L, what is the value of x right here? Okay? What is the value of x at our known station? Okay? And here's how I'm going to define this. Okay? This right here is the PVI, or the VPI. And the station of the VPI is 52. The station of our known point, so we're trying to match a, a railroad crossing, the, of our known point, the station of our known point is 53 plus 50, okay? So I propose that for this problem, x is going to be L over 2 plus something. And what is it going to be L over 2 plus 150, okay? Why is it L over 2 plus 150? Because this is x equals 0, this is x equals L over 2, this is x equals uh, L. So to get from here, if this is x equals 0, to get from here to our point in question, we go L over 2 plus 150. D does that make sense? Is everybody okay with that? Okay. So if you understand that, the only other thing we need to figure out is how do we figure out the elevation of the YVBC? And I propose that the way that we're going to do that is we're going to take the elevation of the VPI, which in this case is 1261.50, okay? And how are we going to do that? So let's say I gave you the length. If I gave you the length, like if you knew what L was, how would you get from here to here? How do you do that? Y'all remember that? This is the low point, so we have to add something, right? rise over run, right? So we add the value of that slope, right, times L over 2. And maybe what I should do is say it's the absolute value since we're going up. Does that make sense? Because the, ele the elevation of VPC has got to be higher than the VPI. Make sense? Okay. If that makes sense, I think the goal seek aspect will, make, will, will be pretty easy to understand. So let me show you what's going on here. So I have here a little spreadsheet that I set up, and there's, there's not a lot on here. You could probably copy this down pretty easily. But all I have here is G1, G2, 
and I put a value in for L. Um, I got a space for this coordinate X and this coordinate, this value for the YVPC. And then I'm going to have a calculated value and a target value, okay, for the elevation, okay? Um, and to be clear, um, just to make sure we're on the same page, let me see if I can copy this. Let's see, let's, let's snap that. There we go. So to be clear, let me put this right here. So our target elevation is going to be 1271.20, okay? So the idea is that I'm going to calculate an elevation, but the target elevation is going to be this point right here. So here's how this is going to work, okay? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm, let me highlight this, this cell L here. Let me make this yellow. I'm going to make a guess for the length. Anybody want to give me a guess for the length? Make a number up. Seven. Seven? Yes. Seven. Okay. All right. Seven. Now, I will tell you that's a bad guess. And the reason why, the curve's got to be at least 150 feet long. Yeah. That's pretty close. Give me Maybe a guess. I meant seven. What, 700? Plus another... 693 feet. Okay, we'll do 700. Nice save. Okay. No, but in all seriousness, so does everybody recognize that the curve needs to be at least 100 feet long? But there is a reason for that, trust me. Um, okay. So if I know that the curve is 700 feet long, and I, I'm going to tell you that's the wrong answer, but let's just assume it's right, then X is going to be that divided by 2 plus 150 Okay, and the YV, uh, uh, VPC is going to equal 1261.5 plus, and then what am I going to do? I'm going to do the grade, which is 4%, times that over 2. And I'm not even referencing the cell, just, let's just do this. Okay, so to be clear, if I were to make this 600, Everything else updates, okay? So everything below this is, if I change this, everything else up here changes. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna calculate the, uh, the elevation. I'm gonna calculate the elevation using my function for the parabola. So calculating it is going to be equals the PVC or the VPC plus G1 times X plus, and then I got a fraction, so we'll use some parentheses, G2 minus G1 divided by 2 times L times X squared. Oh, squared. Okay. And I know that's wrong, right? But what's going to happen is you can see, so like as I make this bigger, see now it's getting a little closer, right? So what do I do? I go to data, I go to the what if tab, and I use goal seek, and I get myself a little dialog box, and what I'm gonna do is, okay, I need a target, I need to set some value to something. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go down here, and I'm gonna calculate the difference. I'm gonna do the difference of these two. And I'm going to do goal seek. I'm going to say, take that difference, set it equal to zero by changing the length. And there we go. Okay. It's that simple. That's it. Any questions? So that's pretty much all there is to it with computing, with doing a goal seek. Um, there you go. So if you want to do it by hand, I, I, get, I went through some algebra. I'm, I might have a typo in there. I'm going to check that. But it, it's, it's a lot messier. Um, or you can do it this way. I think it's a lot easier. Yes? Why we, oh, I got that by this right here. So I took the elevation of the VPI and I added 
0 0.04 times L over 2. So now, but okay, let me go back to, to something I mentioned earlier. Let, let's make the guess 7. seven. Yes. Okay, so what if goal seek? Let's see if this happens. I'm, I'm curious. Let's see what happens. Okay, all right. So this is a, okay, let, let's go back to math. Let's go back to math land. This is a parabola, okay? What we're finding is the times that a parabola that opens like this crosses the x-axis. How many times does a parabola cross the x-axis? Twice. There are two roots, okay? One of those roots is 98, okay? But I posit to you that one of those roots doesn't make sense, okay? This root doesn't make sense because the curve has got to be at least, you know, this long, right? So if you make a guess that's like 7, I mean, yeah, you'll get an answer, but you need to use some contextual thinking and ask yourself, does that answer make sense? And no, it doesn't, right? So what I would do in those instances is maybe try and find both roots and then take, take a look at them, right? So if I make a guess that's, you know, kind of big, um, what if goal seek set that zero by changing that? Now I get an answer that I know is a little bit more consistent. And now I can take that length and I can... Stake it out, do PVZ, PVT, all that stuff I did before. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Any questions on that? Okay. So I kind of roughed out this, this derivation right before class. It gave me a, an excuse to use uh, LaTeX a bit, so it's all typed out. But I might have a typo in there because I think my answer was a little smaller. So I'll check and see what happened there. So, okay. <clears throat> all right. Uh, I think I'll see what the answer is, but that's great. All right, um, any questions on that part on sizing a curve to meet through a point? Hopefully, this part's pretty easy. Hopefully, that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so you do have a homework problem like that, but I do say on the homework problem, use Excel. Like, I actually don't want you to do it by hand because it's just more laborious than it needs to be. Okay, so. And I'm of the opinion that, I mean, Excel is a tool, and if it's the right tool for the right job, use it, okay? That's how you get good at Excel, is to <coughs> use it, okay? When you just submit the uh, spreadsheet. That's a good question. Um, what I would suggest is, uh, you can if you want, you can upload it with everything, but in your assignment, like maybe include some snapshots of everything that you need, so. But go ahead, please. Like, I'd rather you submit your spreadsheet uh, than not. I have no problem with that. Sound good? Okay. All right. So the other thing that I want to talk about, we're starting to dip our toes a little bit into CE 342, is I want to talk about designing vertical curves for given design speeds. Okay. And what we're specifically interested in is a parameter called sight distance. Has anybody ever heard of that term, sight distance? Okay. Good. This will be new stuff. Okay. So um, when we're designing horizontal and vertical alignments, one of the things that we have to worry about is ensuring that we have proper sight distance for our alignments. Now, there are two different sight distances that we are concerned about uh, as transportation engineers. The first is what is called stopping sight distance. So in, without getting too far into the weeds of a transportation engineering class, a stopping sight distance is basically the following. I'm driving down the road, I'm going a certain you know, uh, 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 design speed, I'm certainly adhering to the speed limit, I'm not going you know, 30 over or anything. And, couldn't help it. I didn't say anything. And I'm adhering to the design speed, I'm adhering to the speed limit, and I see an object, okay? The moment that I see that object, there's, there's sort of two things that happen. There's the reaction time and then the time that it takes for the vehicle to reach a complete stop. Okay? That is what's called stopping sight distance. Okay? So I think it would make sense to everybody that as the design speed of the road increases, the stopping sight distance increases as well. Right? I think everybody's in agreement with that. Um, that is important for, for like all highway designs. Okay, but what is also important is passing sight distances. Now, passing sight distance is more important on a two-lane highway. 
right? Where you actually, like, so for example, like you're driving down the road, you know when the yellow lines turn into dashed lines because then you can pass, you know what I'm talking about? That, so that, that's what we're talking about here. So passing sight distance is the amount of room that you need in order to pass a, a vehicle, okay, a, in order to maneuver safely. So this is according to AASHTO. Is there anybody here that's not heard of AASHTO? It's okay if you haven't. AASHTO stands for the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. If you haven't heard of that yet, you will definitely hear about that next semester. But AASHTO is sort of like the federal association that establishes minimum design standards for all sorts of transportation facilities in the United States. There's an AASHTO specification on bridges. The, um, one of the most famous AASHTO specifications is the ASHA specification on geometric design of highways. It's called, if you ever hear the term, the Green Book. Anybody ever heard of the Green Book? That's, if, if you ever work at a, uh, a consulting firm or at the DOH and you ever hear somebody call about the, talk about the Green Book, that's what they're talking about. It's the uh, uh, manual by which uh, roads are configured, uh, uh, road design, highway design and whatnot. Um, according to ASHTO, based on your given design speed, these are the stopping site distances uh, that you would need to accommodate. So if you were designing a road for a 30 mile per hour design speed and you were concerned about stopping site distance, you would be sizing your vertical curves based on a 200 foot uh, site distance. Okay, does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right. Um, now, here's the thing, okay? Um, whenever you're designing a curve, you, you sort of have two questions you gotta answer. The first is, are you dealing with a crest curve or a sag curve? And I think that's pretty easy at this point by just looking at the grades. But the other one that's probably a little more complicated is what's going on right here, okay? So if I look here, I have, here's a VPC, here's a VPT. So if I give you a stopping site distance and I say solve for the length, two things could happen. You could have one scenario where the stopping site distance is shorter than the length of the curve, and then the other is where the stopping site distance is longer than the length of the curve. And it does change the geometry that you end up dealing with at the end because these are straight lines and these are parabolas, okay? So when you're in design mode, you don't know which scenario you're going to fit into. So the answer is to actually solve for both of them and then only use the one that makes sense, okay? And you, you'll see what I mean when we get into this uh, example problem. Now, um, when it, so, one thing that is worth mentioning is that when you're designing either crest curves or sag curves, you do have different parameters that you kind of need to consider. So, um, for example, when, when you're designing crest curves, crest curves are more about, so if you're driving and you're driving up a hill and you're peering over, the idea is that you're trying to design it such that you can see an object as you're going along the crest, right? So what you've got to consider are not only the height of you as the driver, but you also have to consider the height of what it is that you're trying to see, okay? So we call that H1 and H2. Unless otherwise stated, we're going to use the default values that are specified by ASHTO. So the height of the driver's eye, we're going to take that as three and a half feet above the surface of the road. As for the height of the object in the road, that does change a little bit. If we're designing based off stopping site distance, we're gonna consider an object in the road as two foot high, okay? But if we're designing for passing site distance, we're gonna consider that uh, height of the object as four and a quarter feet, because this is just our default, but this is gonna be the height of an incoming car if we're trying to pass. The, the, that's what we're gonna take as, as, our, as our height, okay? And so whenever you go through and do all the geometry, there's no way I'm gonna make you drive all this, you get these two expressions. You get that the minimum length of that curve is either this or this. And this is the expression that you use if you end up getting uh, a situation where the stopping site distance is less than this. And this is the situation that you use if the stopping site distance is greater than this. In design mode, you really don't know which one that you're, um, you're going to uh, uh, be dealing with because you, you don't have the length of the curve. So you'll just use both and then only choose the one that makes sense. And again, you'll see what I mean. Now that's for designing crest curves. For designing sag curves, really the situation that we're interested in is we're trying to ensure that as we're driving, so think you're driving and you're going down the hill and it's going up like this, okay? 
So what you're, what you're really trying to ensure is that the curve provides enough distance such that the angle of your headlight will provide enough illumination so that you can see the object that's in front of you. D does that make sense? We assume for sight distance calculations about a one degree upward like divergence from the plane of the car to, the, to, the, um, to what's in front of you. That's, that's sort of the angle that we assume. And then we use that in order to calculate the length of the curve necessary in order to be able to see what's in front of you. So the, the two questions about crest curves and sag curves, they're sort of different situations. And so because of that, the design expressions are a little bit different. So, uh, but again, we do still have a situation where the curve could be shorter than the sight distance or longer than the sight distance. So that's why we calculate both and then we just take the one that makes sense, okay? So for when you're trying to compute uh, curve lengths in this situation, so the first thing you need to do is you need to determine whether or not your, the curve is gonna be a crest curve or a sag curve. And again, we can look at the grades to kind of have that make sense. Um, the next thing that we'll do is we'll look up the appropriate design speed for the, the uh, segment in question. So are we trying to design this road for a stopping sight distance or a passing sight distance? So in this class, I'll probably just tell you, but this is the type of thing in a transportation engineering class where dependent upon the problem, you, it might be that you need to just understand which one it is. But again, this isn't transportation engineering, this is geomatics. Um, after you've determined this and your sight distance based on your speed, you can then calculate the curve length um, and you use both equations, um, use default values for your heights, and then you choose the one that, that makes sense. Okay, so let's go through one and kind of uh, uh, make sure this makes sense for everybody. So you know how it's going to go. I'm going to make you break out your Casio FX 115ES Plus or similar scientific calculator if you haven't already done so. I got a few folks that are like, tell you what, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna sit in the front row. Maybe he won't notice if I don't break out my Casio FX 115ES Plus or similar scientific calculator. I see, I see things. Okay. All right, so I didn't wanna hop back and forth between slides and whatnot, so I decided to put this here so it's kind of easy to reference. So um, I have a crest vertical curve that's to be designed uh, to join a 3% grade and a 3% grade. So um, one thing to note is I, you know, I told you in this problem that it was a crest, but if I didn't, well, I'll, I'll just write it here on the screen. Um, keep in mind, G1 is like this, G2 is like this, right? Right? Okay. So you can see that's a crest. All right. Um, and then what we're going to do is do this at a two lane highway, and we are designing the minimum curve length based on stopping sight distance if the speed of the highway is 60 miles per hour. Okay. So before we um, go down the rabbit hole on equations and whatnot, um, we were told that the velocity of the road, the design speed, so we'll call it. V design is 60 miles per hour. And we're designing based on stopping sight distance. So therefore, what is our S value? And I like to draw my little S's with these little tildes on it so they look different than my fives. What's my S value going to be? Five seventy. Okay. All right. So far, so good. Now, I am going to um, hop back to my slides a little bit because I just realized something that I didn't quite uh, uh, um, hammer in that I kind of want to. Okay. One of the things that I kind of glossed over that I want to be clear about is these expressions here, if you notice, I've been, it might seem like I'm being a little fast and loose with my notation, but I'm not. Up until now, so if I give you a 3% grade, up until now, we've been saying that G1 is 0 0.03, right? Because we've been saying it's a decimal. But this doesn't say little g. This says big g, okay? 
And whenever you're in this context, when you're seeing a big G, we're actually taking it as that percent, not as a decimal. So we're going to take this as three. Okay. So whenever you see the big G, that's the number, not the decimal. I should have, I should have uh, 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 hammered that in when I was discussing it. My apologies. Okay. So what we've got here then is we've got a G1, which is plus three and a G2 which is minus three, okay? We take those as the numbers, whereas the, the percent numbers, whereas if they were little g's, we take them as the decimals. Okay, now because we have a crest curve, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna design, we're gonna just compute both of them. I think we need to get a little bit more familiarity with these expressions. They're a little on the hairy side, so I wanna make sure that we're good with them, and then we'll make our judgments uh, a little bit later, okay. Now, let's see if everybody was paying attention before we get to that, though. What was H1? Anybody remember? 3.5. There we go. 3.5 feet. And H2. Two. Two. If we were dealing with passing site distance, it would be four and a quarter. Okay. Okay. All right. So... So for scenario one, I'm going to call scenario one when S is less than or equal to L, okay? I compute an L min of the following, okay? So it is a fraction. We take the absolute value of G2 minus G1 times S squared over 200 times a pile of junk squared, and that pile of junk is the square root of, I don't have anything smart enough to say, so I just started doing that. Okay. <laughs> In order to be classified as fire, it needs to be a mixtape. There needs to be multiple tracks. I'm sorry. I disagree with that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was around when they first started, when the, when the youngins first started saying fire, and it was originally referenced to be a collection, not a single track. I got a cassette in my back pocket, man. I love my job. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're talking when we when we see this G2 minus G1, this is the absolute value. So G2 minus G1 is going to be negative 6. So the absolute value of that is just 6. And we have 570 feet squared over 200 times and what's going to happen here is we're going to have the square root of foot and then square root is going to be feet. Okay. So so from a unit's perspective, this is going to be feet. This is going to be feet squared. It's going to cancel and it's going to give us an answer in feet. And we'll say like three decimal places just so that we're all clear on the answer, you know. Anybody got an answer for me on this one? 903.211. Do I have a second on that? Second and third? Okay, then I, I now definitely trust it. Okay, so the second scenario, let's just calculate the second one. Says that this, this holds true if S is greater than L, okay? So for this one, L min, is 2s, hold on, I can do better than that. And again, I, I like to use these little, little tildes, these little hashes on my s so I can see that it's not a 5. Minus 
this fraction. So we're going to have 2 times 570 minus, and so on the bottom of this is just 6, 200, actually let me make sure I make this neat, so 200 So what do we get for this? Do I have a second? Yeah. Okay. Now, all right, so now we have to ask which one makes sense, okay? Now I claim that the one that we should use is scenario one, okay? And some of you might be thinking, well, why not scenario two? Let's consider what's going on with scenario two. So scenario two says S has to be greater than or equal to L. Remind me, what was S? 570. And what is L from scenario two? Does that make sense? No, right? Because for scenario two to be valid, S has to be greater than L, but it's not, right? It's smaller than L, right? So this scenario is invalid. But I mean, if you'd like, we can go ahead and take a look at scenario one. S is again 570 and L is 903.211. In this case, it is completely valid, right? Because S has to be less than or equal to L and it is, right? So this is the scenario that we use. And again, you, have, you kind of have to do both because in design mode, you don't know what the length of the curve is going to be to meet the speed. So you just do both. And again, only one of them is going to be the one that's, uh, that's valid. So. So the problem said, so let's just make sure we're all on the same page. What the problem say? We're designing the curve to meet the requirements of this design speed. I propose that the length of the curve is 903.21 feet. That is the answer. Okay, that's what we're after. We're after this curve such that um, by, by installing a curve that is of this length, we will provide sufficient stopping site distance for a road with a design speed of 60 miles an hour. Okay? All right. Any questions? I've given you a problem like that on the homework as well. It might be a sag curve, though, instead of a crest curve. So you might have to use the other expressions. But again, they're in the slides and... Let's be clear, I want to show you something before we leave. Um, here is the FE reference handbook that I gave you last time, or actually I gave you last week, and this is also on Blackboard as well. Um, but if you, go to, if you go to page two, you will actually see these expressions right here. Um, the one thing that you'll see is they are written maybe a tad differently. So you see this term A instead of G2 minus G1. But A is right there. So, so it's just shorthanding it for you. OK, any questions? All right, so I want to I mention something before we, we close today. So if you recall, I told you that today's lab, or today and tomorrow's lab, if you're in Thursday lab, is set up a little differently in that we are going to start doing the calculations in the room. We start in the room and then we go out to the field, okay? Sound good? But no job saving or anything at the total station like that. All right, I'll see you in lab.